Good morning and welcome everybody to this third seminar in the Get In Shape webinar series brought to you by the Financial Services Council. The Financial Services Council is a member organisation of insurers, uh, key service providers and ancillary uh, companies that provide services to the financial services industry. And many of our members distribute products via financial advisors. So quite early on in this transition, uh, we set up an advisor transition working group, which I chair. I mark them each of each from Partners Life. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing as part of that, that, uh, that working group is producing a series of webinars to help you prepare your businesses for this new regime. So th these webinars are designed to be very practical, uh, to give you a little bit of homework at the end of each webinar that you can do over the next couple of weeks uh, to prepare before the next webinar. Now today it's my pre pleasure to introduce to you our three, uh, our three experts uh, in the field. We have, I'm just going to go from top to bottom on the screen here. At the top, we have Steve Burgess, who's a Canadian, who's uh, relocated himself to this great country of ours. Been here for a number of years, and I worked with Steve a number of years ago at the Financial, at the, uh, sorry, at the Financial Markets Authority, uh, where Steve was in the team that did a lot of monitoring for the AFAs. Uh, he has his own business now, the Compliance Refinery, uh, which does a lot of advice and compliance work for, uh, for financial services businesses. Carty May and I also work with at the Financial Markets Authority a little bit after Steve's time where Carty managed one of the teams that did monitoring and supervision, which included uh, financial and vice businesses, AFAs, as well as all other types of businesses in the financial services industry. And Carty now runs a compliance uh, consultancy called Rosewell Consulting. And I've done a lot of work with Carty. In fact, if anyone's familiar with the Partners Life Advisor Support Program, uh, Carty's the brains behind that. And then we've got Nick Summerfield, who's a partner at Anthony Harper, specialising in financial services and doing a lot of work with clients, both large and small in the financial, the financial advice space and a specialist in this area as well. So we have three fantastic experts. Today's topic is around compliance with the Financial Advisors Act, because of course, while you may have a little piece of paper from the FMA saying you have a transitional license, you don't actually have a transitional license yet because they don't exist. They won't exist until the 15th of March, 2021. And between now and the 15th of March, 2021, you must continue to comply with the Financial Advisors Act. So this webinar is designed just to make, keep, keep in the back of your mind the sorts of, well, in fact, the front of your mind, the things that you need to be doing now until the 15th of March next year to make sure you're compliant with the existing legislation. Before we step into this one, I want to have a quick recap of what we did in the previous session, which is available on the Financial Services Council YouTube channel. Uh, there is a playlist called Get In Shape. And all of the previous Get In Shape webinars are on that playlist. The previous uh, webinar was around preparing contracts with authorized bodies, advisors, contractors, and other suppliers to make sure you've got firm written contracts with all of your suppliers. If anyone has been uh, reading the proposed standard conditions of uh, full licenses for financial advice providers, you'll note that outsourcing is one of the standard conditions and having robust contracts with your outsource providers is one of those key standard conditions. So it was a really, really topical session. Uh, and without further ado, I will now hand over to Steve, who I think is leading the first couple of slides of this webinar. Welcome. Thanks, Mark. Always a pleasure to be here. Um, thanks, everybody, for attending. We're all really excited to be a part of this, and we hope you guys get some value out of it moving forward. Um, today, we're going to run through the timeline for the new regime and what you should be doing in that process. Mark touched on it a little bit, but it's something we all need to be very cognizant of and we want to make sure you understand um, what happens between now and 2023 um, so you can prepare your business. Um, we're going to talk about understanding the Financial Advisors Act and your obligations. Um, I think a lot of us have kind of weaned off that a little bit and just a, we felt a good refresher in that space would be quite valuable for everybody. Um, so we'll go through the different um, areas there. We'll talk about advertising, FSP registration, which is an area that we see quite a bit of issues in, disclosure statements, care, diligence, and skill. Replacement business is probably one of the biggest risks, and then we'll touch on record keeping. Um, just to start off, we wanted to go through the period up until March 15th, 2023. As you can see from the area, er, arrow, where we are right now, we're quickly or not so quickly moving towards March 15th, 2021, which a couple of weeks ago, that was the date set up for the new regime starting. Um, where we found a lot of confusion 
um, is that some people still seem to be confused with the fact that it's actually the 15th of March, 2023, that you need to be ready to be a FAP. It is a hard transition date, and the FAA will be repealed on the 15th of March, 2021, and you'll be expected to operate in the new regime as a FAP, and that's how you will be judged um, moving forward. Um, what that does allow is the transitional period is for you to get a full FAP license. So as Mark touched on earlier, you have a transitional license. That transitional license becomes effective on the 15th of March, 2021. Um, everybody has becomes effective the same day. Up until that point, you're still operating under the Financial Advisors Act, which is why we're here to talk to you about it a little bit today. During the two-year transitional period, you'll be expected to apply um, and receive your full FAP license. And you'll also have a competence exemption. So you'll have to have the uh, correct educational, meet the educational requirements and competence requirements uh, before the 15th of March, 2023. I will pass off to Nick now to talk about your obligations under the Financial Advisors Act. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, just before I touch on that, just a request as a bit of a housekeeping, please, if you don't mind, if you're going to send through questions through the chat or Q&A, um, which we're very happy to receive, can you pop in there your name um, and your email address just so that we can pick that up? And if we can't cover it in the session, we'll come back to you later on. Um, so Mark in his introduction is quite rightly made the point that um, some people have already got a um, transition license and, and others will be in the process of applying for them uh, and that's all well and good but we've still got a period through until March next year where um, everyone must comply with the requirements of the Financial Advisors Act apart from a couple of small concessions um, which we'll come to later there are effectively no concessions from complying with current law um, this is a piece of legislation that's been in place for quite some time um, Really, the expectation is that everyone um, you know, knows what they're doing is on top of it. Um, and I think everyone can expect FMA to police behaviour in the, in the market on that basis. Um, at a high level, there are general obligations under the Financial Advisors Act that apply to everyone. Um, they cover advertising, um, a general care, diligence and skill requirement, which we'll spend a bit of time talking to, um, disclosure obligations and then related um, to the above registration on the FSPR. We're going to cover each of those, um, as I say, in a little bit more detail as we go through this morning. Um, but just to note, they're the main obligations. There are some other incidental bits and pieces um, that do also apply. And then I think it's also just taking a moment to remind ourselves that uh, under the Financial Advisors Act, there's any number of different categories of advisor and advice and product and what have you, and the various obligations that you will have under the legislation or you do have at the moment do depend on that. Um, so, for example, and, and really most importantly, if you're an AFA, you have obligations that go above and beyond just the general stuff um, mentioned earlier in that slide and that you... Um, you don't need to be really conscious of making sure you comply with um, a couple of slides on AFAs later in the session, um, assuming we don't run out of time. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose that's the main point to note. We're, we're going to get rid of these distinctions come March next year, but for now, um, we all have to work with them. Um, so that is, thank you. Um, okay, so advertising, going, starting to drill down into a little bit of the detail um, a little bit of detail, starting first with the advertising. So um, under the Financial Advisors Act, you must not advertise a financial advisor service in a way that's misleading, deceptive, or confusing. If you do that knowingly or recklessly, that is an offence. Um, and the fines for that are up to $100,000 for an individual or $300,000 for a company. So not as significant to some um, as some other offences, but certainly something that you don't particularly want to be um, up for. Uh, in any way. Um, misleading, deceptive or confusing as concepts are things that are reasonably well understood by lay people, um, not necessarily something you need a lawyer to tell you or a compliance professional to tell you what you can and can't do. Um, if you feel like you're pushing the boundaries, you probably are. Um, if you don't have the ability to back up what you're saying, if you can't substantiate um, a statement, don't make it. Um, a, a lot of this is common sense stuff, but 
it's certainly really important to bear in mind. Noting that advertising can be a really wide ranging concept. So there's things that are obviously advertisements that we will all recognize as such. So, um, you know, newspaper advertisement or a client newsletter that you send out. Um, will also extend to online advertising, uh, advertising via LinkedIn, if you do that, um, Instagram or other sorts of social media. Um, and then in theory, and I guess depending on the messaging and the circumstances, it could go so far as things like business cards or sign written cards. Um, the definition legally is effectively very broad, as I say. It's a form of communication relating to your service or something that's reasonably likely to induce a person to seek out uh, your financial advice service where you authorise it or you're involved in it. So very broad. Um, something to be very careful of and conscious of in terms of how you conduct your business. Uh, a couple of specific points here. So it probably goes without saying, but um, if you can't provide a particular service, don't advertise it. If you're an RFA, don't advertise um, your ability to give personalised advice on KiwiSaver. Um, you would fail um, at the first hurdle of that because you just couldn't do it anyway. Um, and then a note for AFAs here, if you're an AFA, there is a specific statement that must be included in advertising, it's there on the screen, a reference to your disclosure statement being available on request and free of charge. Um, with that, hand over to Carty. Great, morning everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so one of the other key obligations is being registered on the FSPR um, register and we're already seeing or we're still seeing a lot of advisors being incorrectly registered so I think it's really important that you go in and check and know what you're registered for now and make sure that you're registered for the right service but even um, more importantly if you're making any changes to your business say if you're selling part of your portfolio or you're purchasing or you're merging into another business all these are sort of triggers for updating your FSP registration um, got called in to help just as um, recently as last week for an advisor who had um, no longer was going to be an AFA, so wanted to make sure he wasn't going to be a reporting entity for AML anymore. But uh, FMA very quickly picked up that the firm he was joining um, was registered as a broker and wanted to know, well, wouldn't you still need to be a reporting entity for that purpose and so on? So all of a sudden we found a whole lot of issues that were previously unknown. So it's really important to, to understand um, if you need to be registered for that service and what it actually means. There's a couple of generic ones which most advisors are registered for. That's the financial advisor service and the wholesale and or generic financial services. Um, if you're employing advisors, you want to pick the employer or principal of a financial advisor and or QFE. Um, the broking service is, is unlikely, unless you're actually holding client money, um, that you're operating um, a client money trust account, possibly you're getting that audited, you're probably a reporting entity for AML. So just be really careful of ticking that box if you don't fall into that category. And a lot of AFAs are also registered for keeping, investing, ministering or managing money, securities or investment portfolios on behalf of other persons. And that's quite common if you're um, managing an investment portfolio for um, your clients. So make sure you go back and have a look at that, but uh, just remember the triggers there too if you're changing your business during this uh, preparation time for the new regime. Okay, Naomi, we'll move on to the next one, which is your disclosure statement. Um, now, again, disclosure statement is another area that uh, we're still seeing advisors go wrong at the moment. Remember your current disclosure statement, it's very prescriptive in the regulations. Literally, all you can do is copy and paste what's in the regulation, stick your name and personal information on it, your logo on top. That's about as much customization as you can do. Um, but you've also got to remember that you've got to give the disclosure before you provide the advice or as soon as practical afterwards. And you have to make sure that you actually give it to the client or email it directly to the client. Lots of advisor businesses saying, oh, isn't it enough that we've got it on our website and a link? 
And the FMA website is very clear on that point that no, that isn't enough because website links can fail. So make sure that uh, you actually have a good process of making sure it gets to your client. Um, some of the other things that we see go wrong, sometimes the advisors have joint disclosure statements. Now, while um, the legislation allows for it, the regulations were never actually drafted to set out what a joint disclosure statement looks like. So again, the FMA makes the point that you can't actually have a joint disclosure statement. Uh, you can't provide a telephone disclosure if you're providing advice on Category 1 products, so that's like your securities and so on. Um, and the final one that we see going wrong at the moment too is the disclosure statement needs to be signed by the advisor. Now, at the bottom of the disclosure statement, there's actually a declaration. And as the advisor, you are signing off on the information being correct and you're making a declaration. Now, we have seen some um, advisors not signing their disclosure statement or even getting the client sign the disclosure statement. It's really important that you, as the advisor, actually sign off your own disclosure statement. Now, you can sign that electronically, but remember that if you do want to sign it electronically, you've got to comply with the, um, the little bit of legislation, which is the Electronic Transactions Act that says um, your signature has to adequately identify you and the person receiving the disclosure has to consent with the document being a scanned signature. So there's a couple of sort of traps that you can fall into with those disclosure statements. So just uh, watch out for those. And perhaps the final one is remember to put your full legal name on it. So you want the same name as uh, you've got in the FSP registration. That way clients can find you, they can make sure that you say you are who you say you are and that you're on that register. So it's really important to have your correct name on it. All right, my last one now is a bit on care, diligence and skill. So um, this is, in my mind, you're probably your most significant obligation under the current regime to act with care, diligence and skill. And it is a very wide ranging obligation. It covers things such as assessing the product's suitability for the client's needs, explaining the key features and any limitations on that product to the client. So as well as features and benefits, um, anything that it doesn't cover, any risks associated with that or anything that might be associated with that product, so such as loadings or exclusions, all those things need to be considered. And you need to clearly articulate any risks or limitations on the service being provided. So what we see at the moment when we're doing a lot of reviews on statements of advice and the advisor's client, um, advice process is that we're seeing a lot of advisors over limiting their service, really limiting their advice to such an extent that they're almost trying to limit themselves out of their obligation. And I think you need to be very careful about doing that because you've still got these care, diligence and skill obligations that you really can't fully limit yourself from. So be very careful about uh, the scope of your advice and think about what you can and can't limit. And if you're unsure, get, get some advice, get some help with that. We'll put a link there. So if you're going back over this uh, website later on, um, the FMA website has some good uh, explanations on what a reasonable financial advisor would do to demonstrate this obligation of care, diligence and skill. And that's things like really understanding the nature of requirements of the client, um, setting out the nature and service and the circumstances in which the advice is provided, and keeping within scope the type of financial advisor that you are. But fundamentally, keeping really good records of the advice, the key documents that you give with the advice, and everything that really collectively form that advice process, whether it was emails, records of discussions, um, comments that the client made, make sure that you keep good records of those as well, so that you can demonstrate uh, how you've discharged that obligation of care, diligence and skill.
All right, we'll pass it uh, back over now to Steve. Hi, thanks, Cardi. Um, one of the areas we wanted to touch on was replacement business. Um, that's an area I think that uh, the FMA is probably um, rightly so determined is one of the areas of highest risk. And that's something I think at least Cardi and myself, um, when we're out in the field, see as one of the things that could definitely be done better um, and an area that's probably more detailed than other areas that advisors should be focusing on more. So it, it is much higher risk advice to potential customers. You, you do see it come up in the media from time to time. Certainly, it's an area the FMA has delved into um, with, with its own investigation. Um, and these are the areas where you need to be providing comprehensive advice to clients. You can't limit the scope um, to something that isn't necessarily involved in that space um, or involved in the original advice. Um, and you need to make strong comparisons between what the old product was and what the new product would be. Um, th that's really important that you get right down into the actual product details so you can outline and say, this is what's actually, th this is what you used to have. These are the differences between that and what I'm recommending. Um, the, the more detailed, the better. Um, because these are the areas where the client can come back and say, oh, I used to have that, but I don't have that now. I didn't understand that. And the way I always think of it is your, an advisor is going to be really sophisticated in terms of product knowledge and understanding. When you've got a client on the other side, risk is the area where clients probably understand the least and it's the most complex. Um, if you look at a paper, there's always an investing section of a paper. There's always a homes and mortgages part of the paper. But risk is probably where people generally um, have the least understanding, the least sophisticated understanding. Um, so I'd say just really focus, put in the product features and the comparisons around them. Um, and it is definitely not okay to just say something like the product is cheaper or the person wanted to deal with me as their financial advisor and things that are kind of more generic and more basic, but it's harder to find kind of tangible um, variables in there that really ensure the client is in a better position. Um, highlighting benefits can be really misleading. You have to highlight the benefits, but also balance that. Um, think about it like a teeter-totter. So if it's only benefits, that's great, but a lot of times you're getting a feature or two here um, and on the other side, um, you might be losing a feature. You might be, your cover might be different on the other side. So you have to point those out and, and have a balance so the client can really understand that. And then what are the material um, differences relevant to the client? Um, you know, once again, any loss of benefits, really important. Um, cover for pre-existing conditions. Um, adverse consequences of changing product provider. And, and these need to be um, actual tangible, um, tangible things that are going to be material to the client. Sometimes we th see things in there. Um, I know I've seen a number of times, oh, the um, credit rating is this. Well, it's the same credit rating as the other one, or at times it's actually lower, which is kind of amusing. Um, so make sure you put a lot of... Um, you put a lot of emphasis on what the actual benefits are and potential adverse consequences. Um, one of the areas we see quite a bit is when you go in and you're giving advice um, and your initial advice is, is, is fine, um, but then you move on and you go through the underwriting process. Um, a few points about the underwriting process specifically. Um, if the advice looks entirely different after underwriting, you should definitely give new advice. So if you're doing replacement business and you've gone through underwriting and in underwriting, somebody either got an excess or an exclusion and then you started changing amounts through that underwriting process, you, you, you should consider at some point that it's material enough that you have to re-advise the client. And you can't just necessarily go forward because the original advice was suitable and was in the client's best interest, even though it's changed on the other side. It can be more expensive, you can have exclusions, those types of things, really look out for those. We, we see that quite a bit 
where the advice was given, what they end up with is completely different. And you're looking at it and you're saying, mm, I don't really know um, if, if, these, if, if, if you're comparing apples for apples anymore. Um, and it's really important in that underwriting period to communicate well with your client. Like I said, there, you should have some thresholds where you actually just go through and give advice again. You could have other thresholds where you're looking at it and you're saying, I need to file note this. Um, a lot of advisors and advisor businesses in that, in, in that space will communicate via email back and forth. What I think you really need to do is get to a point where you, you summarize everything if there are significant changes in the space. Um, that, that's the area when we're looking at the original advice and then we see what was actually implemented and you're looking at it and you're saying that that's significantly different. Why, why isn't that more similar? Um, I will pass off to Nick now um, to talk about record keeping. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, and there's a nice um, sort of segue from replacement advice into record keeping. And I think um, record keeping, I suppose, the first point is actually it's very important, but you can tease it out and ask yourself why. And I think you can look at it from um, a client perspective and then from an advisor and compliance um, perspective as well. And I think the starting point is probably taking a wider view of, of records and thinking about how you record your advice um, to provide it in the, to clients in a way that helps them to make a decision and understands, um, you know, the pros and cons of the advice and the consequences and the like. And, and that's, um, you know, sort of that's really what Steve's talked about, um, that replacement product advice is the area where it's um, certainly the biggest um, challenge or the biggest issue. But um, first of all, records in terms of clients, a so statement of advice um, and the like and recording what advice is given. But then um, flipping that around and looking at it from an advisor's perspective and saying, well, um, you need to be keeping records to demonstrate how you've met your legal obligations. And, and I'm thinking principally here around the care, diligence and skill requirement. Um, you need to be in a position to effectively justify um, the advice you've taken and, and the way you've conducted the engagement so that if there is a complaint, um, either to you or to FMA, um, you're in a position to um, effectively cover yourself um, uh, you know, to avoid any sort of sanctions that might come your way otherwise. Um, and it goes beyond just that care diligence and skill requirement. So um, keeping records to show you've disclosed conflicts of interest, uh, keeping records um, to show that you've disclosed limitations on scope of service, and then um, noted down the bottom. So keeping records to show that you've given disclosure uh, and when it was given and the version of the disclosure statement that was given and the like. Um, Record keeping is an interesting one because it's the type of thing that advisors will often fall over on. Um, it's very, I say it's easy, but you know, people will give good advice and then fail um, and that sort of final hurdle of documenting things properly. And if you can't document what you've done, then that is the point at which um, things start come a cropper, so to come a cropper. So can't overemphasize the importance of good re record keeping, both in terms of specific legal requirements, and there are some, particularly for AFAs, but more as a matter of good practice um, and as a risk management strategy. Um, with that, I think turning to Steve to talk more about yeah. AFAs. <clears throat> yes, I was actually gonna make a couple notes there on record keeping. Um, as technology is changing, um, one of the things we're noticing is that a lot of advisors are communicating with clients via apps. Now, whether it be Facebook Messenger, um, WeChat, texting, um, those kinds of things. So I just wanted to make a couple of notes of that, that as technology is changing, you know, it used to be great when everybody emailed all the time and then you had a record of that email. So you always kept that record. Um, so that was easy to meet the record keeping requirements. Um, now, you, like I said, we're seeing people using apps of all kinds of different sorts. Um, to communicate with clients and to discuss things with clients. Um, if you go back to replacement business, sometimes people are talking about it, you know, on Facebook Messenger, all kinds of things. Um, so what I'd like to say is if you're doing that, either make a strong file note once you're done that kind of communication strand where you actually go through, summarize what was included in those um, and make sure that's on your CRM. Um, you can also take screenshots because a lot of these, um, you, you know, we've got s some CRMs have the ability 
to include, as an example, texting out of the CRM. A lot of them don't. So it's not recorded. So you need to find a way to record that communication. So you can use screenshots and that type of thing um, as well. Um, and if a lot of advisors are now kind of recording calls either via video or audio. Um, so what I just wanted to really talk about with that real quick is make sure you emphasize that it's a business interaction. So don't go into it, um, chat about drinks you had with friends, a lot of social things um, that can really sway things. Um, best practice, I'd say, if you're kind of, if, if you know the person relatively well socially, have a chat with them um, and then start recording the business end of that um, for that. Um, if you've got a business with other advisors, make sure you train people on it and you audit them from time to time to understand the quality that's coming out there um, because that can be an area of risk. Um, yes. So um, just a couple notes on, that was just a couple observations on that. In terms of authorized financial advisors, I think a lot of you, hopefully all of you, are up to date on what, what will be going over in this area. Um, giving personalized advice on category one products, um, I think most of us know that, um, and that will be changing in the future. Um, personalized DIMS services and provide investment planning services. So if you if, if you design or offer to design a plan, plans that include um, analysis on current and future financial situations, identify investment needs and goals, and recommendations or options to realize those goals. Um, should we click over to the next slide? Um, and then additional obligations, we'll just run through a few for you as we've got a few minutes left. Um, you, you know, you need to be approved as an AFA by the FMA, registered as an AFA on the FSPR. Um, and as Cardi went through earlier, um, make sure those cate categorizations are, are noted correctly. Um, a member of a disputes resolution scheme, um, file an annu annual regulatory return. Um, however, I believe that's been pushed out um, into the new regime. So the earliest you'd probably be doing that is uh, sometime 2024, most likely. 2023-24, um, in whatever form that comes up as again. Um, you're likely to be a reporting ent entity under AML CFT. Um, you don't want to get offside there. Um, have an up-to-date advisor business statement. Um, and advisor business statements are something that I'd really encourage um, people to consider. They'll, they're great help as we go into the new licensing regime. Um, and they're great for an understanding of what your business is, especially if you've got a bit of a bigger business. Um, it, it's a really good thing for new employees. They can read about your business, understand everything about your business. Um, a really good, valuable tool if it's done right. I think the original intention was they would be a bit of a, a business plan moving forward. Um, and they haven't necessarily consistently been um, being used that way. But um, I've found with a lot of businesses, they're great tools in terms of bringing new people onto your business so they understand your business. Um, yes, very good tools. Um, follow the code of professional conduct, um, CPD hours, we all love those, and uh, meet your conditions of authorization. Yes, so that is it from us. Uh, we'll pass over to Mark for a summary and maybe Mark uh, can throw any questions that have popped up. Um, that I think that's me, Steve. Oh, sorry, Cardi. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. That's all cool. Hey, look, um, look, there's just been some really good questions that have popped up, particularly in the disclosure area. So we might just share some of those questions so that everyone's had the benefit with that. One of the questions was about the primary disclosure statement for AFAs. Do you have to give it over and over again? Well, yes, if it's a new client, you need to make sure they receive it. But if you've got an existing client, they've already had it, there's been no material change since they last had it. You don't need to give it again. Probably you more want to focus on your secondary disclosure statement, which is more specific about your service and costs and things like that. So, but yeah, the primary one, definitely that's really the obligation is to give it to the client up front. That's your main obligation there. The other question that we had a couple of times was about 
to what degree do I need to ensure that the client understands the advice? Well, this is really being drilled into more in the new regime, but even in the existing regime, under your care diligence and skill obligation, it's still good practice to, to have things in place to make sure that your client understands your advice. So have it simple, concise, easy for them to understand, easy for them to ask you questions about it, and you have check-in questions. Does this make sense to you? Is this what you were looking for? Do you understand? Removing things like complicated industry terminology and things. Sometimes clients are scared to ask simple questions because they don't want to look silly if they don't quite understand the technical jargon. So it's really all those simple things, um, but it does form part of that care diligence and skill obligation. Um, the other thing was a few more things about disclosure. Remember, disclosure is dependent on the type of financial advisor that you are. So whether you work for a QFE or whether you work for yourself, um, that's going to trigger different disclosure obligations. The type of products and services that you give financial advice on, that needs to be reflected in there. Um, and the business model too. So if you work for, uh, say, a QFE that has a call centre, their disclosure might be a lot more phone-based. If you're an RFA or an AFA that regularly meets your clients face-to-face, -face, it's more likely that you'll have a disclosure statement type um, obligation there. So just make sure what your current obligations are. So really, so we're going to do a bit of a quick round table to sum up, and then if there's any other questions, we're happy to answer them. But in key summary is, hey, let's be really clear on your current obligations, because at the moment, that's what the FMA will be measuring you against and monitoring you for. So between now and the 15th of March next year, if you have a monitoring visit or the FMA is looking at your website or doing any desk space type reviews, they will be holding you accountable under the Financial Advisors Act. Yes, there's a lot of obligations between the new regime and the existing one, um, that look very similar, but just be clear that uh, which regime you're operating under and that you can demonstrate, I show with evidence, how you meet the current regime. I think it's a really good idea to fix any issues that you've got now before you actually move into the new regime that's got so many more components to it. And if you're in doubt, get some independent advice or a review or even talk to your peers and so on too. So what I might do is hand over now to Nick, maybe for a final word, and then to Steve. Thanks, Cardi. Sorry, I was on mute. I think, um, look, I suppose by way of final comment, I, I would actually largely endorse the comments that you've made, Cardi. Um, we've got another nine months or so in this regime. Um, most people are generally pretty familiar with what's involved, but um, what we're doing now is, is similar or um, sort of a, a base level of what the future obligations will be. So now's the time to really make sure you're aware of your current requirements, get your head around them, and I suppose think about using the time as a bit of an iterative step up to answer, um, you know, develop your processes for the new regime. Um, use the time wisely, fix issues now, as Cardi said, and then, um, you know, look to move on um, next year. Cool. And Steve, any final words of wisdom you're in? Um, I think we've covered most things and I think we're just about on time. Well done. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I think it's important that businesses do focus on the regime they're in now. Um, that's really important. Um, and, you know, you have, to, you have to keep doing what you're doing successfully now. Um, you might be able to improve a couple of things that you've learned on in here. Um, but really um, have your focus moving towards March 15th, 2021 in terms of having made a decision or making decisions and being prepared to move into the new regime. Yeah, I think it's really tempting to try jump into the new regime now, but I think the key focus of this whole webinar is don't lose sight of your current obligations. And it's very difficult to, to try and mix them up too. I was sort of looking at disclosure last night thinking, how could you make it work? Can you sort of do a mixture of both and sort of semi-over-disclose? Really, that there's a whole lot of complexities with that, and it would be easier just to be clearer between the two regimes. And, of course, remembering 
how the FMA are going to hold you accountable at the moment, which is solely on the Financial Advisors Act. Um, so, Mark, shall we hand over to you for um, some your know, next steps? Sure. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Nick. Uh, it was really great to have that good summary of what the existing legislation is and that reminder that between now and the 15th of March next year, that's the law you must continue to, reply, uh, to comply with. While you may have, if you're intending to apply for your own license, you may have a letter from the FMA saying transitional licenses in your hands. They don't exist until the 15th of March next year, and the existing legislation is what we have to continue to comply with. Keep in mind that at the same time, you'll need to be ready to switch over to the new regime on the 15th of March. So while you're running in the Financial Advisors Act at the moment, you still need to be thinking about preparing your business for the regime switch over on the 15th of March. So that's where the difficulty is gonna be in, in juggling those two things. And the remainder of this webinar series is to help you do just that. If you haven't yet either dis discovered or, or made arrangements about whose transitional license you'll operate under in the new regime, or if you decided to get your own license, if you haven't applied for that yet, do get that underway. Uh, the FMA is, is encouraging people not to leave that to the last minute. And while the changeover date is the 15th of March next year, keep in mind that New Zealand is closed in January and it takes us a little bit while, a little bit of time to come out of our, our summer slumber in February. So if you haven't applied for that transitional license in 2020, you might be at risk. If you don't have that transitional license or operate under a business with a transitional license on the 15th of March next year, you won't be allowed to give financial advice until you have a full license. It's going to be a much bigger hurdle. So don't miss the boat on this one. Make sure you get those applications in. Uh, the process for getting a transitional license is really straightforward. It's designed to be because it's largely a process to enable the FMA to get an idea of how many full license applications they're going to get. So as we've covered in this webinar, uh, make sure you're complying with the existing legislation. Don't jump the gun to the new legislation. Make sure you've still got that disclosure statement in place. All those other requirements you, you're complying with up until the 15th of March next year. And in the background, make sure you're working your business towards complying with the new regime from the 15th of March next year, including getting that transitional license if you're intending to do that for your business rather than being engaged by somebody else's. A huge thank you again to Steve, Carty, and Nick. Our next webinar, we're taking a slight detour from our, our usual series. So the series that, that we've designed here is around giving you little chunks to help you prepare your business and to make sure that you're going to be compliant both now and in the future regime. In the next webinar, we're going to have the experts from the Ministry of uh, Business and Innovation and Employment, the Code Working Group, and the FMA to discuss the Financial Services Legislation Act, all the recent announcements, the things that we know about licensing. So absolutely recommend that you come along and come armed with your questions. Uh, my big question for the FMA is when are you going to be releasing the licensing guides which will have the minimum requirements to have a full license? So hopefully we'll have, you know, 100 people or so ask that question of uh, John Bodica next webinar and we'll, we'll, you know, hound them until they actually release them and give us an idea of exactly what we've got to comply with. So please come along to the next webinar. The details, if, if you want to... Uh, register for those webinars and you're not already on the mailing list, send an email to the FSC, fsc at fsc.org.nz and you'll get on the mailing list and then you get all the invitations come through into your mailbox. They don't bombard you with email, so it's, it's not one that's going to uh, fill your mailbox worthwhile getting on the mailing list. And before you finish up today, please answer our poll. While we've got ideas for about the next I think 10 webinars, and I did make a mistake right at the start. I said this was the third webinar in the series. It's actually the fourth webinar in our series. Uh, so thank you very much for attending the fourth webinar in our series. But with, while we have another 10 or so webinars lined up in terms of what we have in content, the reason we haven't announced those is because we want to be flexible and get your opinion of what you want to learn about, uh, or what you want these webinars to cover. So please answer the poll, give us some feedback, uh, send direct topics in as well if, you, if you've got ideas for what you'd like us to cover in these webinars, and we'll uh, move around the, the planned content as we go to suit the requests of what we have from, from you guys, because this is all about financial advisors and all about you and making things easier for you. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, thank you again to our experts, and I will absolutely look forward to continuing to help you uh, as we all do getting through to this new regime on the 15th of March next year. 
Have a great weekend and we'll see you at the next webinar.